Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. This is the day the Lord's made, so what are we going to do? Yeah, and what else? Amen. Praise God, I tell you. It's good to be a child of God and born of the Spirit of God. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about those that have been born of the, the Spirit of God have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a good place to have your name. Hallelujah. In other words, you don't want it not to be there. Hallelujah. But thank God tonight we're going to study the Word of God. It's going to be great. Amen. You all having a good summer? Huh? Amen. You know, it's better than being in jail, so, you know. You can get excited about that. Of course, you know, people are on vacation. Then, of course, we've got the little COVID thing running around, and that's uh, tried to uh, trash a few things and keep people uh, slowed up a little bit. But hallelujah, none of these things move us. Amen? You just keep on keeping on, keep going, keep moving. Amen? And uh, so uh, we're excited about what's going on. I talked to my son, Brian, about camp, and I think that uh, the kids' camp is going great. And uh, they're having a good time there and all of that. And uh, so it's good. So pray for them and believe God with us. You know, so many times these kids, when they go to these camps, I mean, they, they can be very life-changing and life-altering, um, transformative uh, for them. And, uh, you know, you'll have a lot of eight-year-olds that God speaks to them about callings and ministry and all kinds of things, which at the time um, probably didn't mean a whole lot to them. It's about like when my... Uh, um, father-in-law would uh, set my wife up on a on the uh, uh, cattle pen, you know, on the wood fence, and say, "I want you to pick out the biggest one you can find." They'd go to the stockyards, and uh, so when he was selling cattle, he'd take his daughters with him and set them there and say, "Pick out the biggest one you can find." So they'd pick that out, and then they would cut that out as one lot, and that would be for each of the girls. And he said, "Now the reason I'm doing this is so that you know when you." Uh, uh, get ready to buy your first house, you'll have a down payment. Well, you know, when you're eight years old or 10 or however old she was, guess what? You ain't thinking about no down payment on a house. But you know, there came a day when uh, we bought a house and thank God we had a down payment. So, you know, uh, sometimes these things that uh, happen in people's lives, and it's, it's true really for all of us. You know, God can say some things to you about his desires for your life and the purpose that he has for you and they're, they're, they're spoken at that time, but, you know, we have to walk those things out. We have to live those things out. None of us are here without purpose. And I say that, let me qualify that. None of us are here without divine purpose. You are not born into this world just, you know, because somebody thought it was a good idea. No, you were, uh, you know, the Bible says he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. So there is that purpose, and of course that has to be our pursuit as individuals to discover what that purpose is, but it's a good one. He said, I know the plans I've got for you. They're plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope. How many of you think having hope's a good idea? And to give you a future. Praise God. So these are the things in, in terms of what the Bible has to say. I'm not interested in man's ideas. I'm interested in his you know, what does the Bible say? Praise God. And there's so many things that are going around these days, you know, ideas and doctrines and goofed up things that uh, really foul people up. Stay with the Word of God. Amen. What does the Bible say? Praise God. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But anyway, let's grab our Bibles together and uh, you maybe have a device or something like that. Let's open them to the book of Ephesians uh, chapter 6, if you can find that opening. Uh, in your Bibles. Praise God. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. Let me remind you this Sunday we'll be having communion together, so we're excited about everyone joining, coming, and being a part of that. Hallelujah. You know, God gave birth to the church. Well, actually, the Lord Jesus Christ did, and uh, He did it for a purpose, so that you and I could have community, so that we could have fellowship. I thank God for the church. Amen? I mean, when we first got started, we didn't have a church. Uh, we went to church, but we really didn't have a, a life-giving, spirit-filled church. And God graced us with uh, uh, Fellowship Church. Uh, at the time, it was Fellowship of Faith Christian Center. Try to brand and market that if you, you know, uh, think that's a good idea. The thing was long enough to go halfway around the world. So we shortened it up. Fellowship Church, hallelujah. And uh, that works a little bit better. But uh, I'm so grateful, you know, over all these past four decades now into our fifth and... Uh, 
uh, the, the people that God has brought into our lives, the people that we have seen uh, make decisions for Christ, to be born of the Spirit of God, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, to live a life, praise God, that's honorable to Him. Amen? Hallelujah. So it's been wonderful, and praise God, the best is yet to come, because He's coming again. And we're just going to get busy for God, you know. Uh, many of you know Joel Morris comes and uh, speaks here at the church from time to time, and he's talking about, praise God, this is not an escape uh, theology that we're preaching. It's a hustle theology that we need to be preaching. You know, it's not like, oh, God, just come quickly. Things are so messed up. Well, you know, Jesus said things would get messed up. But at the same time, there's still a harvest to be reaped. He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. We are the reapers. And so we might, if, we get, if you want to go home, get busy. Hallelujah. And if you'll do that, then praise God, you'll get to go home sooner. Amen. I remember when I was a kid on the farm, you know, they'd say, well, you get these, get these uh, bales picked up in this field and you can go home. Well, you know, it, it, it kind of made you hustle, especially if you had something that you wanted to do or, you know, you wanted to be done with or whatever the case might be. And so the same thing's true where the kingdom of heaven is concerned. So did you all find Ephesians chapter 6? Let's bow our heads together, we'll pray, and then I'll get into what I want to share with you this evening. Father, we're so grateful. As we come, Father, with reverence and humility, we approach the Word of God, Father God, in, in a manner of, of, of reverence. We thank you, Father God, that you've made your will known to us. It's within these 66 books. And Father, we ask you to open the eyes of our understanding that our hearts may be enlightened to know the hope of your calling, but not only that, Father God, to be able to live a life that is honorable unto you. And I thank you, Father, for the freedom, hallelujah, that we have in Christ Jesus, glory to God forevermore. And I just thank you, Father, for your blessing in the church and the victory that you've given to her, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about understanding the battle that you're in. Most time Christians... Um, it's not necessarily on their radar. And uh, not only are we engaged within a battle, but I want to I I talk to you about how to successfully, you know, uh, manage that warfare. Because Jesus made, a, made you a winner. He made me a winner. He made us victorious. And, you know, there's so many things that are going around in the world today that are so negative and things. And, you know, we're hearing all of this and that and the other. And praise God, that is not at all what Jesus called us to. Can you say Amen. And so he called us, praise God, to understand the battle that we're fighting and dealing with and how to fight a successful warfare. Now, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the Bible makes these references to, you know, you're more than a conqueror. huh? And who is it that causes us to overcome in this world? Of course, Jesus does and our faith. So when the Bible is making reference to terms like overcomer, conqueror, winner, successful, you know, as, as a believer, then all of these are designations that Jesus made possible for the child of God. And yet, right on the other hand, we see a lot of times Christians, you know, struggling, um, um, struggling in their walk, struggling in their, their, their Christianity. And that's not at all the way that God intended for it to be. So there must be an answer. Wouldn't you agree with me? I mean, there must be a way in which we can wage a successful warfare and not have to succumb to the defeat and all of the different things that we see that people experience within their lives. You know, um, Christians, unfortunately, they're, 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 sometimes they're unfaithful. They're, they're unresolved. You know, they don't, they don't really know what they believe. They're confused. That's the, God is not the author of confusion. Isn't that right? But of peace. Isn't that what the Bible says? So that ought to be the place that we find ourselves to be in. But again, you know, how is that, you know, how does that realistically and practically come about where our lives are concerned? And I will tell you, one of the fundamental things is Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. The book of Proverbs says to buy the truth and don't ever sell it. So the truth is, is really what is important when we talk about, you know, how you and I are going to manage ourselves uh, in the circumstances that we find ourselves to be in. Because God wants you to have joy. He wants you to have peace. Amen? Hallelujah? Can I get an amen? amen. 
All right, thank you. Praise God. So, <clears throat> the last time I checked, Jesus came so that we wouldn't have to live a funky, defeated, and messed up life. Hallelujah. So, if that's the case, when he said, I've come so that you can have life and life more abundant, then praise God, let's get on that train. Let's figure that out, and let's get after it. Can you say amen? So, the two biggest problems, I think, facing Christians um, is number one, ignorance, and number one, the, or number two, the failure to act on the Word of God. Notice this verse of Scripture with me. How many of you believe that the Bible's God speaking to us? So anyway, in Paul's writings here, especially this letter to the Ephesians that he wrote, you know, the first thing he talks about, if you want to take Ephesians and kind of break it up into three pieces, basically, the first uh, few chapters talks about our calling. And then, you know, after that, then it starts dealing with in chapters, well, actually, uh, probably more so four and five, your conduct. But then this last chapter, chapter six, he starts dealing with specifically about the conflict. So the reality is, is when he wrote this letter, he talked about their calling. He talked about how they were to conduct themselves. And then also the conflict that we find ourselves to be in. Notice with me in verse 10. Notice it says, finally, my brethren. In other words, one more thing that I want to communicate with you before I go. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Everybody say that with me. Be strong in the Lord. Lord. Say it one more time. He said, be strong. He didn't say be weak. He said, be strong in the Lord. Now, we'd never be asked to do something if we were incapable of it, right? So we can be strong in the Lord. God wants you to be strong in Him, and then it goes on, and in the power of His might. We're not talking about our own strength. We're talking about His strength and the ability that He gives us. And then he goes on in verse 11 and says, put on the whole armor of God. In other words, clothe yourself with the whole armor of God for this reason, that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. Now, let's, let's unpack that for just a minute. First of all, he says, I want you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then he says, I want you to put on the whole armor of God And the reason for that is so that you can stand against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. So we have an adversary, and he is Satan and all of his cohorts. He went on then in the next verse, in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high and heavenly places. So he tells us we're in a warfare, all right? You know, a lot of Christians, they probably look at that and say, well, I don't want to talk about that. I, just, I don't even want to think about that. You know, I just want to, you know, uh, talk about peace, love, dove, and kumbaya, and let's build a campfire. But the reality of life is, everyone, listen, we're engaged in a warfare, we're in this world. We're not of it. Are you with me? So, so to stick your head in the sand is the worst thing that you can do. You know, when I got saved, I was so turned on to Jesus, I didn't know anything about spiritual warfare. I didn't know that I was engaged in, a, in any kind of a battle. I just loved him, and he loved me, and his love was overwhelming to me. And all I wanted to do is obey and serve him. And that's a pretty good start. But as you go down the road of life, you come to discover that there are things that God has done through the redemption that is in his son, and there are also things that you as a believer are going to have to do in order to see the manifestation of his will in your life. Lots of people live and die and never experience the full will of God within their life. And a lot of it has to do to what you and I have come to know, to understand, to believe, and, and to, to recognize as the truth. Are you with me? Well, thank God we've got his word. And he wants us to be lifelong learners so that we can have everything that he promised that we could have. But again, for Christians, two big problems, again, is ignorance, what we don't know. And then the other thing is it's a failure to act on what it is that has been provided for us or we could say failure to act on the Word of God. And so 
I mentioned this secondly, but it's in my notes here. I'll say it again. Most Christians don't even consider the fact that we're engaged in a battle. And, and, um, and I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to be uh, mean or, or anything, you know, but, but the, the, the reality is, is that a lot of Christians live on the sweet pill of emotion. And, you know, as long as everything's going great, I'm great. But I mean, as soon as everything goes in the tank, I'm in the tank. Well, that isn't the way that, you know, God didn't call us to do that. Amen? You know, and so when I say uh, sweet pill of emotion, uh, uh, you know, (laughs) I don't really know how to describe it, but it it is emotional in the sense, you know, you're feeling the love, you're feeling the peace, you know, and and, um, uh, feeling... You know, just, you know, we're, you know, acceptance. Have you any, any of you heard that word? Acceptance? You know, it, you'll hear it all the time. People will say, well, you know, we're, we're supposed to have love and acceptance. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. I said that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches love and repentance. And that subtle twist is what upsets and distorts and messes a lot of people up. In other words, we're supposed to just, whatever anybody wants to do, that's okay because we're just, we're supposed to accept them as they are. Well, I'm all right with the fact that, you know, you got to find wherever it is that people are, but you know, God has called us to turn away from our sin or wicked way and walk in the direction that he has for us. But we have, in the, and, and here's what it does. It breeds weakness in believers and children of God. You know, remember the scripture, it says to be what? Be, be strong in the Lord. And I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about being demeaning. I'm not talking about uh, thinking that you're better than anyone else. But there is a standard that, to which he has called us. Are you listening to me? You know, I use the illustration all the time, but if I got a sliding glass door and I got the screen open, or I mean, I got the door open, the screen shut, and a coon decides he's going to tear the screen off and come inside, I'm not just going to say, hey, come on in, man. We, we accept everyone. You know, you can do whatever it is you want. Tear the place up. If you can find food, it's all yours. No, man, dude, I'm going to tell that thing it's going somewhere else, and it's going to get physical if necessary. Are you listening to me? I mean, in that circumstance. And my point being is, is that, you know, you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. And again, we have to tie our lives to the truth. So as, you know, I'll give you a great example. I thought that living by faith was basically you didn't have to work, you didn't have to do anything, you just believed God and he would bring the money in. Well, guess what? That don't work that way. And, you know, here I was, you know, supposed to be such a man of faith and power. I was nothing more than a kid with paste and flour. You know, it's about all it amounted to. I had to go all the way to South Dakota, Brookings, South Dakota, for a guy. You know, the Bible talks about in meekness instructing people that oppose themselves, lest preadventure they will find repentance to the acknowledge of the truth and recover themselves out of the uh, snare of the devil that are taken captive by him at his will. That's exactly where I was, dude. I was deceived was deceived. It was not a, a, a mistake of the heart. It was a mistake of the head. And so this guy, after, you know, we had this Bible study, to this day, I don't know who he was, couldn't find him, couldn't tell you who he was, if my life depended on him. He said, well, can, can I share a few scriptures with you? I said, sure, man, I'm a word man. Come on, bring it. So he takes me to the Bible, and he shows me this scripture that says that if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. You know that's in the Bible? I said, look at that. You know, that's, that's pretty astounding stuff. And then he goes to another scripture that says that if you don't provide for your own, that you're worse than an unbeliever or infidel, that uh, King James says. And so all of a sudden, man, my eyes got opened up to the fact I was being a knothead. Okay? So what did I do? I went back home and went to work. But see, the thing about it is, is what it, what it did was, is it, it, it kind of, well, essentially it gives the body of Christ a black eye because I'm believing something that's not true. I think it's true, but I don't, it's not. 
because I don't have the whole counsel of God. But thank God I learned and I changed. Amen? And so when you start talking about, you know, these different things that people are going through, man, dude, you got to walk toward the light. You can't live in the darkness and say, Jesus, bless me. That's not the way it works. But if you'll walk in the light as he's in the light, then praise God, we can have fellowship. Amen? But so much of it is don't make waves. It's really not, it's naive, everyone. It is naive to think something along this pattern. Well, you know, God has everything under control and we don't have any real say-so in the matter. That's not true. I said, that's not true. God is sovereign and he is going to fulfill his plan and purpose in this world that he has brought into being. He will do that. But on the other hand, you as a child of God, as a believer, you also have a say-so in the way things are going to go. How many of you understand that? Okay, And the thing about it is, is that when you start talking about uh, matters of sovereignty and things of this nature, what, when you say God is in control and I don't have anything to say about it, that is not true. It is a distortion. And it really is an exaggeration of God's sovereignty. Because what it then does is it, it's an abdication of response. I don't have anything to do with it. I mean, I can't control nothing. I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, it's really up to God. And that must be God. That must be his will because after all that happened. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in people's lives that are not the will of God. Are you listening to me? So again, I refer you back to the truth of God's word so that we can know the truth and the truth will make us free. Are you with me? And so in that, <clears throat> you know, when you, when you start to embrace the truth, you're going to have battles. You're going to have to, you know, stand up for what you know, have come to know and believe and understand from the scriptures, because there's always pushback, you know? Um, you know, let's say, for example, that you discover in the, in the Bible that God has given you his peace, Jesus said, my peace give I unto you, not as the world do I give, but my peace I'm giving to you. Peace I leave with you. Of course, that came in the form of the Holy Spirit, his indwelling presence, things like that. But a lot of people live with worry, anxiety, fear, you know, different things of that nature. And, they, and in, in a lot of ways, they just, they put up with it. They've known it for so long, they don't know how to shake it off. But thank God you can get in the book and let the book get in you and it'll drive that stuff out of your life so that you don't have to experience fear or intimidation or anxiety, worry, or any of these kinds of things. Hallelujah. These are the things that God wants, but you've got to fight for them, okay? If you're just going to lay down, you know, and just say, well, you know, I don't know what I can do about that. Um, that's, that's, that's not his plan, and it really doesn't honor him. He gave his life. He shed his blood. He paid an, uh, the ultimate price so that you and I could live. And we ought to honor him with the way we live and say, Jesus, we're going we're gonna to do this right. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So that means sometimes you got to fight for your kids, you know, and, and in different ways, in various ways. It may be in a matter of prayer. It may be, you know, I don't know what, you know. I mean, a lot of times our kids, they get exposed to all these things. As a parent, we got to stand up and say, no, we're not, huh? -uh, no, we're not doing this. I am so thankful for these parents who are saying, hey, that's enough of this nonsense because we need a myriad of those kinds of people that will stand up and say, we're not accepting this. You know, there's a handful of people that are trying to distort and destroy, you know, the, 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 the righteous, godly kind of lifestyle that we have come to know and understand. And believers need to stand up and say, no, no more. Are you with me? You know, and so again, we're not trying to be adversarial or mean or whatever the case might be, but, but I tell you what, praise God, you got to learn to stand up, you know, for what is right. That, that's what I'm saying. And, um, and if you do that, praise God, God will honor it. So we have an adversary and I tell you this much about it. He didn't come, he's not here to play badminton. Are you with me? He's here to kill, steal, and to destroy. And you have to understand that, you know, and in the context of what we're talking about. I'll give you an example. Jesus didn't start his earthly ministry till he was 30 years of age. We have no real record of anything in, in his life or 
uh, his dealings in life or any of that until he was baptized of John and Jordan. Then the Bible says that he was led of the Spirit of God out into the wilderness, basically, you know, to determine his marching orders and what it is that he was going to be doing. But guess what? Hell followed him out there. And so we know about all the temptations he experienced. And the point I want to make to that is is that hell showed up on Jesus' doorstep the minute that he began to move towards the will of God and the ministry that Jesus called him to. Are you listening to me? I mean, again, we don't have any record about anything else, you know, in reference to his life prior to that. But I can tell you this much, hell showed up to see if they could get it stopped. The Bible says that he left that him for that season because he, had, he, he, he didn't gain any ground. I'm talking about the devil. So if Jesus Christ faced this kind of opposition in his life and his ministry as a child of God, you're going to face the same thing. You are. He is the God of this world. And it's not something to be feared. It's something to be understood. That thank God he's under our feet. Jesus spoiled principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world. He made a show of them openly. And he triumphed over them in it. And he went to his disciples and said, All power and authority is given to me, both in heaven and on this earth. Now you go in my name and make disciples. So we're authorized under the, the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ to go do business for his kingdom. Hallelujah. But again, we're going to get pushback. There's, there's undoubtedly no question about that. But again, the same opposition he faced, we're likely to face the same. And so, you know, <clears throat> um, this is a study in and of itself, but you got to learn who your, your enemy is. Paul said, we're not ignorant of his devices. Sometimes I wonder about Christians. They, they, they stick their foot in the trap of offense. They stick their foot in the traps of unforgiveness. They stick their foot in the trap of envy or jealousy or, you know, whatever else that you want to describe. And then all of a sudden they end up captured and the devil destroys their life and messes them up. They, they stick their foot in, in, in the trap of uh, disillusionment. That's a huge one. Every child of God will be disillusioned by, you know what I mean by that? I mean, you're going down the road of life and you thought this was the way it's supposed to be. And guess what? It ain't that way at all. You know, because you haven't learned enough. You haven't gone far enough to understand. And, and, and everyone, Peter, you know, he said, man, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never deny you. He goes, oh yeah, you will. He said, you'll do it three times before you hear the rooster crow. And he did it. Huh? But, but Jesus told him these things, you know, so that, that, they, that they could understand, you know. And, and a lot of the rest of them, you know, they were saying, show us the Father and, you know, it, that'll suffice us. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he went on and explained it further. And they said, oh, yeah, now we get it, we get it, we get it. He says, do you really? He said, before the night's over, every one of you are going to cut and run. And he said, I'm going to be alone, but I'm not alone. So God knows people. He knows you. He knows me. And he wants us to grow in our character and, and to develop into the people that, that he can use to, for his glory. Are you listening to me? And praise God, you're the one. You are the one. Not somebody else. You're the one. He has given you everything you need to live a life of godliness. He has, has purchased you with his blood. Praise God, made you a new creation in Christ. And you can do it. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want to do it. You know, I want to get up there and say, hey, good. Well, I want to hear it. Well done. Now, good and faithful servant. I don't want to be the knothead that buried my talent in the backyard. Huh? I want to be the guy, praise God, that took what it is that God entrusted us with and did something with it. Your life. Hallelujah. Well, you know, I just can't this. You're not a victim. You're a victor. And you have got to learn that. You know? You're not on the bottom of the totem pole, praise God. He has lifted you up, raised you up, so that, praise God, you can be more than a conqueror through him that loved you. Can you say amen? So it's important for us, praise God, to always wash ourselves with these truths and to know what it is that God has done for us. Because, again, people need to know who their enemy is. 
You know, he said, well, I know, you know, the devil, he's our adversary, you know, and Peter talked about being sober and vigilant and all this and that and the other, you know. But I'm telling you, I don't think a lot of times people really, they capture the reality of what it is that he intends to do when it comes to your life. Drive a wedge in between you and your spouse or your kids or whatever to divide and conquer. It's a huge tactic you know, a scheme, a while of the devil. And we need to learn these things. You know, um, I've, I've mentioned this before, and, and um, with some reservation, I, <laughs> I don't know that I recommend the movie, but how many of you ever seen Patton? Many probably have. Well, George Patton was, George C. Scott, I mean, that guy, man, he, he, he knocked it out of the park. But he was, he was crude, he was rough, and, and he was all of these different kinds of things. Well, in one of the scenes, you see him, he's in bed at night, and he's reading um, his, basically his adversary, Rommel's book. He had wrote a book on tactical warfare and tank warfare. And so what does Patton do? He, he realizes, I need to know, i got to get inside the head of the person that is my adversary. So he read the book, and he knew, you know, what it, how his thinking went, and so on and so forth. So in one of the next scenes, they're out, you know, in the in whatever military theater of of warfare that they were involved in, and Patton had situated all of his people in a, in a specific kind of way because he anticipated that Rommel would perform in a certain way, and sure enough, he did. Well, he blew the living daylights out of them. So the point being is, you got to know your enemy. You know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are engaged in this warfare, and it's important for us to understand that. So with that thought in mind, what kind of weapons or armor should the child of God be armed with in order again to wage this successful warfare? Well, let's read on here a little bit. Uh, Again, in verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. So take, everybody say take, take unto you, take unto you. And and the implication there is this isn't going to fall on you. This isn't just going to, you know, all of a sudden, here you go type thing. No, you got you to gotta embrace or take unto you the whole armor of God so that, as he goes on then to say, that you'll be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with, what's the word? Truth. Now, I don't know if there's a a priority to the order of these matters or not, but I think that having the truth is pretty important, okay? Then he goes on then to say, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I don't have time to unpack this, but essentially, you know, our righteousness is uh, uh, like filthy rags in and of ourselves. But Jesus came, paid a price, and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Are you with me? And so the reason I point this out to you is, is a lot of people live their Christian lives condemned. You know, they've made mistakes, maybe they've had failings in their lives, and they never got past it. They just pulled up alongside it and parked. Well, you know, it's to be regretted that there was a failing in their life, but guess what? There is forgiveness with Jesus, and he wants you to stand up and, and start walking again. But again, a lot of Christians don't. They just they can't get past it, you know. And so they, they, they just park there. They struggle. They, they do all these things. Well, if you, if you come to a place of putting on this breastplate of righteousness, you'll come to understand that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Are you listening to me? You know, that's what the Scripture says in Romans chapter 8 and 1. Now, that's not a license to sin. You can just keep on doing whatever you want, but you get it, okay? And I don't have time to go much further into that. Notice it goes on then to say to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, what's the word? Peace. Peace. And above all, taking the shield of what? Faith. 
so that uh, you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? And then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then finally, praying always uh, with all manner of prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So these are the <clears throat> things that you fight with uh, uh, in, in your battle. And what is that? The truth, righteousness, peace, salvation, the Word of God, and prayer. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians real quickly. Over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice something here that Paul talks about. You know, Paul understood the warfare that we find ourselves to be in, and he communicates it in numerous letters about how you and I can be successful in what it is that we need to be doing here. Verse, um, well, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now that's important. Even though we're in this fleshly realm, you know, and living in it as a human being, we do not war. Our warfare is not after the flesh. In other words, we're not using fleshly means or natural human means to deal with uh, the fight that we find ourselves to be in. Let's go on reading here as it goes on to say. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. Now listen, for the weapons, everybody say weapons. Yeah, there's weapons. The weapons of our warfare are, are not carnal or they're not fleshly, you know. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hmm. And then it goes on to explain what that is. Casting down imaginations, some of your Bibles will say reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and then having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So again, the weapons that we use in this warfare are not fleshly, but they are weapons that have been given to us by God. And notice what it says, that what we're really dealing with is, is that str these strongholds that get put in people's lives. You know, if a, a person experiences adultery, let's... let's you know, you, you become the victim of a, an adulterous situation. That is an immediate attack on that person to destroy their lives and to build a stronghold in their life that will wreck and ruin them forever. You know, I've talked to people all the time. They go through the, 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 the uh, it's, a, it's an absolute tragedy. But people go through divorces, you know, with, with some degree of frequency. And the biggest problem is, is that you, you know, because it's happened, in their lives, and it was so painful and it hurt so much that they're not willing to risk to love again. It's like, no, man, I went through that. I ain't never going to do that again. Well, you can do that, or you can find within the grace of God how to get yourself out from underneath that and go on and live. Are you listening to me? It is so to be regretted the things that people experience within their lives. But I'm telling you that if, if you don't know how to manage that, if you don't know how to uh, uh, navigate, it can become a stronghold in your life. And people, you know, <clears throat> instead of getting better, they get bitter. And then it comes out. You know, you see it. It, it, it manifests itself within their disposition and their, 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 even their personalities and things of that nature. They've been hurt. You know what I'm saying? And it can be all different kinds of things. So all I'm saying is, praise God, that whatever it is that comes our way, God is bigger than any of those kinds of things. And he wants us to succeed and overcome. How many of you believe that? Amen? So <clears throat> these weapons aren't, aren't fleshly. A, a weapon that God has given to us is the name of Jesus. He said, you go in my name. And whatever you ask in my name. You know, so he's, he's entrusted us with his name. And that gives us authority to exercise the will of God where our life is concerned. You know, I mentioned to you about this COVID thing, you know, and we just got, you know, word that some people were dealing with it. And, and uh, 
were requesting prayer. Well, dude, I got all over it. My wife and I, we got all over it. And we use the name of Jesus because that's the name above every name. COVID has a name, and it is subjective to the name of Jesus. And I tell you what, we told the devil in no uncertain terms that this is a violation of the redemptive work of Christ. Get out of here. Are you listening to me? Having done all to stand, stand. Well, a lot of Christians don't even understand the concept of standing. They don't, they don't understand the concept of resisting the devil. You know, again, they, they got this, I don't even know what it's called. It's like some pseudo-Christianity to me. Some of the stuff that I, well, no, don't go there, Michael. You'll get in trouble. No, it's all good. Praise the Lord. You know, but a lot of times when I hear some people, you know, talking about certain things, uh, even like, in, uh, you know, like Christian radio. Some of the stuff that's on Christian radio is junk. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, but, well, careful what you listen to. How about that? Will that work? Okay. Amen. One weapon again. Well, the name of Jesus he's given to us. But here's one. You know, a lot of Christians, you know, uh, many of them, uh, they don't happen to utilize as a weapon in their life, and that's praise and worship. Praise. When I got saved, I came up in a mainline denomination. It was dead, okay? They weren't preaching salvation. They didn't have a call for people to come to repentance and receive Christ and be born of the Spirit of God. It was just religion. You know, go through the motions, a little 10-minute sermonette, we shake hands, take up an offering, away we go. But you know, when I got saved, man, I got turned on to the living Word of God, man. And I tell you what, praise God, it changed my life forever. And all of a sudden, my eyes are open. And I'm ready, praise God, to be a part. Um, what's that song? I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. You know? And I was. I was all in. Hallelujah. And thank God for that, you know. And the thing, I guess, in the context of that is, is that, you know, um, nobody told us about, well, let me say it to you this way. So as I moved into this, this a newfound love with Jesus, and I started attending some other life-giving churches, and, you know, I, I can remember, I was like on the third row, and maybe she was with me at the time. I don't know whether we weren't married, but... <clears throat> You know, the guy's up there and he's singing, I'm so glad that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus took my burdens all away. You know, and everybody's just, a, you know, this and that and the other, and they're praising God. And all of a sudden they get to the worship part of the uh, service and, and people start raising their hands. And I thought, my God, what, wh where am I? What did I get myself into? But you know, the thing I noticed, it wasn't bothering them the least that they were raising their hands. And they had a smile on their face, and they were just, you know, worshiping God. And so I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a participator. I'm a spectator. And I'm a looking it over. I'm going, man, check this out. I'm like over here, you know. I'm standing here, and I'm, I'm going, wow, you know. And I, I'm looking this way, and it, it was kind of in the round, too, so you could see everybody. When you're in the round, you can see everybody. But I could tell that they, you know, they weren't troubled by it. But see, I had come out of a culture where you didn't do that. Very stoic. Any expression, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, expression of worship and things like that, there was none of that. So to me, it was foreign. It was odd. It was strange. It was, I don't know if you'd say weird or not, but, but on the other hand, these people, they weren't bothered. I mean, nobody else seemed to be bothered by it but me. Why? Because they were familiar with it. So, you know, I looked at the Bible and it says, lift up holy hands. I thought, well, looky there, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are out loud, you know, somewhat spontaneously with, without any orchestration or, or, or direction praising God. You know, they're, they're doing one of these and they're going, glory to God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm so thankful, Father God. I mean, now I'm in a real mess. Why? Because I don't know anything about these things. But so I go back to the Bible, and I look at the Word of God, and I discover, you know what? Hallelujah. 
You know, not only does the Bible say to lift up holy hands, but it's, it says, you know, praise God or I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth and I will make my boast of the Lord. Dude, if you can't do that in church, where can you do it? Or where are you supposed to do it? Are you with me? But you know, the Bible says that praise stills the enemy and the avenger. Let's look at a verse of Scripture real quick. We're almost up on our hour here. But turn to Acts chapter 20, or Acts chapter 16. You're familiar with this incident. But look with me in Acts chapter 16. And I'll tell you what, my friends, you want to talk about a weapon that can be used to your advantage and for your good. It is praise and worship of the Lord. Oh, I tell you, glory to God. You know, when, when, when a heaviness or a, a weightiness or a, 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 just a negative kind of thing comes on me, man, I'm telling you what, my hands are going up, and we're going to start praising God, and we're going to shake this snake off into the fire. And we're going to do whatever it takes. Because when you begin to praise God, when you begin to declare who He is in the midst of your situation, hell is leaving. They're not staying. Are you listening to me? And so it's so important for you to learn. And really, this is the, the real crux of what it is that I wanted to share with you. But I thought, well, you know, I need to tell them about this warfare that we're in and, you know, these weapons that we have and different things. But I, I really wanted to get you to this place. All of this negative stuff that we're experiencing right now in media and government, all of these different things, praise and worship is your weapon to use against it. Shut it off as much as is possible, but at the same time, when it comes your way, baby, you need to praise God. Are you listening to me? You, again, you're familiar with this story. Uh, Paul and Silas, this was a second missionary journey that they had taken, and they were checking the churches out, and uh, they ended up... Uh, <clears throat> Um, um, they went down into Macedonia. And uh, you remember the story where they came in contact with Lydia. They preached the gospel to her. She got baptized. And she said, if you've counted me faithful, come and lodge within my home. And so they were there and they were preaching the gospel. And, um, and of course, then this little uh, witch or sorcerer, uh, um, this demon-possessed girl, kept following them to the place of prayer day after day. And she said, these, these men are the most high God, or from the most high God. They show to us the way of salvation. She wasn't saying that in a kind way. She was mocking them. And the Bible says this she did many days. And yet Paul never did anything about it until about day three or four. And he turned and said to the spirit, it was a spirit that was mocking them. You know, so, so Paul is not you know, singing kumbaya and having a little quiet moment because this, this girl behind him is mocking him. No, he turned and spoke to that spirit and said, come out of her in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says it came out in that hour. Well, that caused a real uproar because there were a lot of her uh, people that were basically trafficking her. You know, they lost all their, their resources that was coming from her. So they made an assault against Jason, or Jason, um, against Paul and Silas, and uh, they ended up in jail, and they beat the living daylights out of them and then stuck them in the innermost prison. So let's, let's pick it up with that thought in mind here. Notice in verse uh, 25, it says, and at midnight. Everybody say midnight. midnight. You know, sometimes we end up in a midnight hour of our life. It's pretty dark. And yet the Bible says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas did what? They prayed and what? Sang praises to who? Yeah, they started singing pra praises to God. The prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Hallelujah, the party was on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, here's what I want to ask you tonight before we close. Why did Paul and Silas do that? Why is it that in the midnight hour of their life when they are in excruciating pain and God only knows what they're having to experience, why is, what's the motive behind them doing that? 
where they prayed and sang praises to God. Now, this is an important note. I want to uh, suggest to you that their choice, everybody say choice. They, cho- they chose to do this, you guys. They were in the midnight hour of their life. Life was not good. They even, you know, had been led by the Holy Ghost to go into Macedonia. Remember the vision that Paul had? And so here they are. You know, now they could have said, God, you know, here we are obeying you. and We're doing what you want us to do. And all of a sudden now we find ourselves in this, in this deal. But they didn't do that. And that's important because when things come your way in your life, don't blame God for what's going on because he typically is not the author of any of it. Hell showed up to try to keep these men from doing what they were doing. These men had made an assault on hell and put a stop to the tyranny of that young girl when they cast the devil out of her. Are you listening to me? So here they are, they're in jail. And so I want to say to you, and this is important to note, their choice to worship and sing praises within that moment were not being dictated by their current circumstances. Huh? I mean, they didn't. Are you kidding me? You think they felt like that? Uh Uh-uh. But I tell you what, praise God, they lifted up their voice anyway. They were motivated by, well, I should say it this way. They weren't motivated by, well, you know, let's just praise God, and then God will bring an earthquake. That was the last thing in their mind. This had never happened in their life, okay? They were just in this deal. So it wasn't like, you know, we'll praise God, and he'll get us out of it. Well, he did do that. But I want you to note that their actions were purely driven out of relationship with him. And when, and because of that, guess what? God showed up. Will he show up in our lives? Absolutely. Every time. Hallelujah. He wants to show himself strong in our behalf. So praise and worship is intended to be a lifestyle practice regardless of current conditions. It invites the presence of and the power of God into your life. You a lot of times won't feel like it, but I tell you what, praise God. You know, it's like the psalmist in Psalm, I think, 42. He says, he says, why art thou cast down within me? He's talking to his own soul. He says, hope thou in God, for I will yet praise him because his presence brings power. So you talk about everything that's going on in the world. What we need to do, praise God, is we need to, we need to up our praise game. You know? I'm, I remember, you know, when we got filled with the Holy Ghost, turned on to the Word of God, we were praising God. People thought we were nuts. You know? Fanatics. We're, they're, they're fanatics. I guess you could say, yeah, we were. But when you discover the truth, you don't care. Or at least you, you shouldn't. And it ostracized us. You know, people, you know, called us names and mocked us and didn't want to have anything to do with us. And, and, uh, but I tell you what, praise God, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Like the one preacher used to say, I wouldn't take it for uh, the world with a fence around it. Praise God. So what I'm going to suggest to you, if you're feeling in a funk, get them hands up. Begin to worship God. And praise Him. Still the enemy in the avenger. Make him shut up because he won't talk when you're praising God. Amen. Uh, That is a fact. And if you'll honor him and praise him, praise God, you'll come to a place where you can get that stuff off of you. Sometimes you'll wake up sometime, you know, and you're, you know, something's, something's not right. Well, if it's not right, get him up. Get him up. Get those hands up. Hallelujah. Begin to praise God, worship God, and thank God and praise him. And then read the Word of God. Hallelujah. Let the, you know, get in the book. Let the book get in you, man. I'm telling you, that's your strength. That's your life. That's what helps us move forward. Hallelujah. It is the truth. It doesn't make any difference what people, you know, come to believe or not believe or if they go off, you know, the rails and go sideways someplace and do whatever. God's living Word is true and it will stand forever. Trust me on that. Let's stand up. Got to stop. Hallelujah. Well, y'all glad you came tonight? How many of you are going to praise God a little bit more here? You know, it's a, it's a choice. It's, a, it's intentional. It's deliberate. Uh, these guys, I mean, you know, here it is midnight, you know, but boom, they just decided, let's, let's do this. And uh, what an outcome. Hallelujah. 
A lot of things happened. Jailer got saved. Family got saved. Everybody got saved. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight. So many more things that could be said here. But God, I believe that there's things here that we've learned, even though maybe we've known them. But God, I ask you to help us to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Help us to lift up our voices in praise and adoration to you, Father. Help us never to apologize for the gospel or be ashamed of what it is that you've done in our lives, Father. Let us stand in the name of Jesus and be strong as the children of God. Father God, I thank you for strengthening each and every one of these that are here, those that are watching online, strengthening them with might by your spirit in their inner man. I thank you, Father, for giving them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, Father. The eyes of their understanding having been enlightened, Father, so they can know exactly what it is you've called them to. And God, I thank you for mobilizing the church, causing her to rise up, Father God, to be strong in these last days, to be the voice that you've called her to be. And Father God, I just thank you for your mercy, goodness, and your grace. Help us, Father. Help us. Help us. Help us. Hallelujah. To awaken, to awaken ourselves, Father. No, not to slumber or sleep, but to be awakened, Father God, to the things that you're doing in the earth today so we can be a part of it. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Glory to God. Glory to God. Why don't you just pray with me for a minute? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, we pray tonight for the discouraged and the depressed. Ah, melambre samara la meste. Father, we bring them before you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, let them help them to see, recognize, Father, that this is not the path that you have chosen for them. This weight, this encumbrance, that which has been imposed upon them, Father, here of late in these most recent months and even years. Oh, Father God, I pray, we pray for them that God, they will, <laughs> thank you, Lord, change, move, reverse, get back, Father God, to what it is they know to be true. Thank you, Father God. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your blessing in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing in their lives. God, we pray that you'll send laborers into their paths and help them, Father God, to recognize the truth to no, one, no longer, Father, no longer to fear, no longer to draw back, no longer, Father, to hide. But, Father, to stand up, praise God, take their place, be the people you've called them to be. We thank you, Lord God, for your divine grace in every one of their lives. That, Father God, that they may live a life that is honorable and pleasing to you. And, God, we thank you for restoring back to them, Father, the joy of their salvation. And, Father God, we thank you for your blessing tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. We'll go ahead and receive our evening.